Um, yes, also from me, <coughs> a very warm welcome on this last talk of the enterprise track. <coughs> Um, so I really like to share um, some insights I gained over the last years while working with my company um, and using native and cross-platform cross apps in the in the enterprise context. Um, my goal kind of is to maybe give you some some guidelines um, and uh, mention some some pitfalls we discovered over the years um, while working in both environments, um, so that whenever you are in the position to make such a big technology decision, um, if you go for a um, cross-platform app or you stay with like two native apps, um, so that you maybe yeah, are able to, to make a better decision here. Um, before I get started, why I think I can, I can give you some insights here. Um, before I started the company Luvago here in Berlin uh, about six and a half years ago, um, I also worked at um, SAP and built a lot of enterprise mobile solutions um, for them, mostly in like prototyping stage. And um, after that, um, I continued to do the same thing with my company. So what we, what we do mostly, we um, enable enterprise customers, in some random cases also startups, um, to, which, which don't really have a lot of expertise in um, state-of-the-art mobile technology, cloud technology, or web technology to build digital products really fast. And then usually we do a couple of iterations on their initial MVPs with them. And um, after that, we, we build up teams inside those companies so, um, so that they can handle the products and the, the technology going forward on their own. Um, and whenever we do such a project, we really start quite early. So we are um, involved in the design phase already. So we are not an uh, engineering-only company. We also have a lot of UX um, designers um, on board. Um, this particular question, hey, should we go for a um, cross-platform app or um, two native apps, um, comes up in almost all the projects. And um, it's almost in the past have been quite tricky to, to answer. And I think over the last couple of years, um, there have been definitely a trend to, also in the enterprise context, use um, cross-platform applications. And this is, again, what I want to talk about today. Um, since this is the enterprise track, I don't want to focus so much on the tech aspect of things. So I really want to take a bit of different perspective here. I really want to um, first highlight also um, how do you set up teams, what is um, important of um, uh, creating uh, either like transforming existing teams or hiring new people um, for class uh, cross-platform developments. Then I will take a look at the product side, which involves the tech side, of course, a little bit. And in the end, I want to um, like give a little bit outlook on the um, economic uh, eco economic side, um, just to give you an idea. Um, because again, people think uh, mostly um, when you use cross-platform apps, at least in the in the in the enterprise context, and they don't have a lot of expertise in these technologies, that you can basically save save half the time um, while. Um, choosing a cross-platform framework. Um, I think in the tricky part also about this, this question um, when you deliver new, new products is you do that fairly, fairly early on in the process, so you maybe don't know all the final requirements, you're still in the requirement phase, and it's quite expensive and hard to reverse that initial decision in the end. So this is why um, it's, it's quite important to, to get that right. And um, yes, that's what I want to share with you. Just to put in a little bit of, of scope, what I want to um, focus on today, um, I don't want to talk about anything regarding the web. I think we heard that in the, in the earlier talks, also in the keynote this morning. I really want to focus on the part cross-platform or native um, development. And I can share some, some insights from, from projects and we did with um, React Native, which I have a in general, quite positive experience. And we also did some projects on uh, Xamarin technology where I have, let's say, a more mixed experience um, with the results in the end. Um, yeah, so that's just the scope I want to, I want to share today. Um, let's get started with the team. So um, as I said, usually we go into companies early when they don't have a team yet. And then um, we either help them to like transform the team they already have, like um, get their existing developers, engineers um, on new technologies, or we help them also to um, recruit people and set up completely new teams. And this is, um, I think there's nothing new when we just look at um, how the different technologies are really all the different frameworks are really used and what technologies they are based upon, we look at, um, let's say, a very wide range of technologies. So every um, native um, 
yeah, framework platform has its own programming language. We have own package managers, so um, on, on processes, on tools. So um, the first thing I even experienced in enterprise projects is that they just tried, okay, we have um, mobile developers here. Why not just use them on a totally different technology, which doesn't work? So um, we usually follow two paths. Either we're gonna um, like try to um, switch people over, and I try to like summarize our learnings here just using some, some t-shirt sizes in terms of if I have a set of developers, how much effort and time is it to basically um, train them and um, make them like productive in another technology. So when we start with um, Android, um, and first have a look at the whole um, React Native part. So I think um, developers, at least in my experience, um, it is like a medium-sized effort. So you're usually going, uh, looking at a couple of uh, months of um, yeah, time they need until they are fully productive in the new environment when they switch from um, uh, pure native Android development to um, React Native, especially considering that um, if you also change the programming model, for example, we tend to use, um, we bring in some web technology, Redux reactive programming also into the mobile world using um, React Native, and then with the change of a programming model, um, developers need a, usually a bit more time to adjust. I think the same is true for, for iOS, so I wouldn't see any big differences here when you say, okay, I have a team of um, Android and iOS developers in order to um, migrate them to the, um, to the React Native platform. What, um, worked really good for us, and also I'm, I'm happy maybe to uh, hear some um, other experiences and feedback of, of your experiences about that, is um, to really take JavaScript developers, um, also full-stack JavaScript developers, and bring them on to the um, mobile team. And um, because they're used to the, to the tool set already, they're used to the processes, and if you use, um, again, reactive programming and Redux in the, in, in, on, on both sides, I think you can have a really good advantage and onboard them quite fast. Um, the thing I wouldn't recommend at all, I had that in uh, one experience when we really had a company that was focused on .NET development and they tried out um, React Native. Um, that turned out to be a quite difficult transition phase because um, they don't have any mobile experience, the tools are different, the language is different, and basically everything is different. So that's kind of the, the learning on the React Native side. It's a bit different on, um, for Xamarin. I don't know if you have any experience with that. Um, this is actually quite popular in enterprise companies that have um, a very wide or very developed .NET stack already um, there because they can reuse existing processes, technologies, developers. So here we experience a quite also streamlined onboarding process when we switch from, let's say, .NET um, development to Xamarin um, development. Um, on the other hand, of course, it's the other way around when you try to um, have a JavaScript developer onboarded to a, a Xamarin team. This is quite challenging. And um, I think iOS, it's a bit more difficult than, than, than Android because um, yeah, the, the platform tools and language are not as similar. Um, so these are like rough ideas for the learning. I would recommend to basically skip the, the, the large parts, uh, the, the, the red ones, but um, if you have to, from a corporate perspective, like onboard a new team, I think this could maybe give you some indication of how fast or how long it takes. Um, the second part, of course, it's recruiting. And here it's a learning I had across different companies, um, different team sizes, um, at least in Germany, and especially if you move away from the larger cities, so if you are corporate in rural areas of Germany, you usually have a harder time just hiring um, experts, expert developers, experienced engineers for cross-platform technologies. This, I think, has a couple of reasons. Um, the only thing as um, I think the message behind that is um, that, again, the decision for framework is not only a tech decision, but it's also driven by, for example, the HR or recruiting department. So try to, to reach out to them, try to identify, hey, can we recruit enough um, experience stuff in time um, for that new platform um, and also in, in budget, of course. So here, if you bring them in early in the project, I think um, you can like have, um, like uh, prevent to have um, delays in the recruiting process and thereby delays in the product, which I actually experience quite often. Um, which actually brings me to the, to the next question, and this is experience. Um, I just 
put a simple timeline out here um, about the first public um, SDK releases, so when really the developer community began to grow. And you can see that um, iOS started in um, 08, then we had Android uh, a year later on. And the first, I would say, cross-platform summary release came in uh, 2013 with their 2.0 release, and um, React Native is really public since uh, only three years. So, um, Again, enterprise companies uh, tend to hire um, for lead positions people with a lot of experience in their field, and this is often a, a position they, they struggle with. So if you have that kind of policy in the company, um, again, that even makes the recruiting pro process harder up front to, to, to set up the team um, according to the experience. Of course, things shift, technologies develop all the time, but um, yeah, there's definitely something to, to consider as well if you want to um, hire a team um, consisting of a lot of senior people. And then, um, lastly, on the, on the people section, um, I think it's also a really important point is the um, yeah, technical culture here. So um, in enterprise environments, I think we heard that before in the talks, things move much slower than in startups and, and environments. So when using cross-platform te technologies in smartups, I didn't have any issues with that. But if enterprise companies, they usually uh, think in release cycles of six months or 12 months even. And here, usually, the, let's say, native cycle um, fits a bit better in the culture, because if you use a, a new framework that isn't very mature, for example, React Native, you have a lot of major releases, you have a lot of code that breaks, a lot of refactoring you need to done just for the underlying framework. And in terms of like management understanding for these refactorings in enterprise companies, uh, my experience is that this is, can be quite hard and challenging. So before I do the final decision on that, also make sure that um, the company, the enterprise company, has the right culture. Um, again, in startups, it's a whole different story. Um, yes, that's about the team. Um, maybe, maybe as a quick summary, I think um, really make sure to talk to all the people involved if you want to transfer a team over, make sure the developers are interested in the technology or that you can hire and recruit the right talent in the right time. So this is like the, the key learning and as well that the whole technology culture um, fits around that as well. Let's move on to product. So here, um, again, we are involved fairly early in the process, so um, we usually do some technical consulting early on before starting off the development process, and um, this is where we make that decision. And no matter what you do, I think this is also uh, common sense, like cross-platform apps are going to be always more complex than native apps. Um, why, why do I mention that explicitly? We got a lot of requests lately from, from people trying to say, hey, we just need an app for one platform for Android, for example, but we want to build it in React Native, where I say, hey, um, this is something I would um, discourage from doing because um, you add uh, complexity that you don't need, that you don't benefit from, and that will uh, definitely cause some trouble down the road. Um, the next point is a kind of checklist. What are apps or types of products I never would build on top of um, cross-platform technology? Um, in the enterprise context, again, right? Um, so we have augmented reality apps. We have um, virtual reality apps. Um, I would say everything that involving complex animation. I think we already heard a couple of examples before. Um, and everything that has platform-specific APIs, where you say, OK, the, the APIs on um, iOS is much different from the API on Android, so we, you would need to spend a lot of time in like writing integration layers and so on. So these are definitely examples I would say um, from the beginning. These exclude um, uh, cross-platform apps, and then we have. Um, Things like watch integrations, TV integrations. I know um, there is uh, recently uh, there have been support added in this uh, areas as well, but I would still say at this point in time I would I would not use cross platforms in these use cases. Also, when you um, do OS widgets, which are appear on the on the on the start screen maybe of your phone, and this is also something I would always say um, to to take to the um, native environment easier. 
And um, another thing, again, and this is uh, specific for like larger enterprise companies which have like, maybe legacy EDM solutions. Um, for example, there are very popular still in, in, in big companies also in Germany like uh, BlackBerry um, EDM solutions. And they have quite complex integrations in terms of security and authentication. And whenever you deal with such use cases, I would also um, recommend to um, use native applications because you're going to have a lot of problems on this level already with those legacy systems and not. Then I mentioned two points, which is maps and GPS tracking. So I think these are ones that are not naturally um, uh, KO criteria for um, the um, cross-platform apps, but here I would build prototypes um, really before making a final decision. So if your um, product heavily relies on maps, and I mean not just uh, putting a couple of pins on that, but maybe doing complex overlays and calculation, I would um, always like build a, build a prototype first, evaluate if the technology can satisfy your uh, UX user requirements. Um, on the, on the same page, um, I'm with the GPS tracking. Again, simple tracking scenarios are no problem, but if you, for example, have more complex uh, scenarios, there are libraries available that basically bridge that gap, but I would always recommend to really build a short prototype, test it, and make sure it works before building your whole app on, a, on this uh, cross-platform technology. The next point I want to mention is DevOps. Um, so we usually build most of our um, build pipelines on Fastlane um, because um, this really helps to yes, um, automate, improve um, developer collaboration, the whole build and shipment process. Um, but here the experience is unfortunately that especially if you're in the early stages of a product and you change a lot of things and you really want to move fast, that means you change a lot of third-party libraries and this means that um, those automated build pipelines need to be adopted quite often, and this is always a big overhead. So if you have a large team, and this large team is um, basically you have your, your, your own um, DevOps team, then make sure that um, yeah, you have enough resources available there to really um, promote this process to really um, fix things in time. And if you don't have an own DevOps project, make sure that you put in enough time and budget on the developer side to like deal with those issues that don't really add value to the product, but um, yeah, rather are about fixing DevOps infrastructure issues. Um, the next point is also only, of course, applies to enterprise um, organizations. So I know a lot of customers who, um, from, from us who have really restricted open source processes and policies. So when you want to use an open source policy, you need to enter them in a system and you get like, um, you need to get legal um, to, to approve on that. And you have to do that for each release again and again and again. And of course also a lot of native apps use open source technology, but in those organizations, um, they already have established processes for those um, native technologies. And in new or fairly new um, cross-platform technologies, this is missing. So um, I had the experience in the past that we spent a good part of the project actually not doing any benefit, but whether dealing with the uh, enterprise processes around um, open source um, certification, uh, which can be quite annoying and of course slow down the project as well. And then the th next I think thing which is quite important is when we talk about third-party SDKs. So a lot of um, apps we build, for example, um, use data from CRM ERP applications, and if those um, SDKs have SDKs, uh, sorry, these, these systems have um, SDKs, they are usually at the very core of the application. Um, this is fine. Um, when you have these kind of bindings, some frameworks call it bridges, so basically you have to have some, some code connecting your um, uh, cross generic cross-platform code to the native SDKs. So if the SDK vendor ships this already, you're fine. If he doesn't ship that, then, um, of course, from a technology point of view, there's no problem. You can build those bridges on yourself. But usually, this comes at such a big cost in terms of overhead and development time that um, I would say if you have to build those red boxes, these red bindings yourself, I would um, rather discourage, uh, to discourage you from using um, cross-platform um, applications because this will burn most of the benefits. Um, the last lesson from that is why I really analyze the um, shared 
third party SDKs, um, I would really try them out. So we had a lot of experiences with, you look at the marketing material or you look at the, do the documentation and they had bindings, but in practice they have a lot of issues, they were outdated. So um, again, if your app relies heavily on third party SDK integrations, um, also give that a try up front before you make your, your, your final decision, otherwise um, you're gonna have much trouble down the road. Um, to conclude with the product section, what is my overall recommendation here? Um, I know there are very different types of architectures, um, frameworks you can use, but my general high-level approach would be um, take a look at your cross-platform code and then take a look at, at your product and identify which parts of the product really need to be um, OS specific. So which part do you need to build for both platforms at the same time, essentially? And if the answer is um, more than a couple of exceptions, I would, again, discourage you from using a cross-platform app because um, in the end, um, this is, uh, you're gonna spend more time in generating these layers and abstraction layers and maintaining them over time um, than you would save in, in, in any like time savings while only using this uh, cross-platform uh, code base. So, of course, you will always have things like notifications that are platform specific or how you enable GPS tracking. So these are all small parts. But again, if one of the core features of your product evolves in an OS specific part, I would simply go with the, with the native um, approach. Okay, that concludes the product section. And the last point is again, let's take a look at the, the um, profits and um, see on that from an economical perspective. So I think the common misconception is, and we get that our sales team gets this fairly early in the process. So they say, hey, um, we have an idea. So we like interact a little bit with the customer, try to get a high level understanding of the requirements, and afterwards um, give them a, a rough estimation in terms of time, effort, and budget he would need for a particular project. And then of course, this decision again comes up, and then he says, well, UX is not so important usually, um, let's just use a cross-platform technology and then we like save half the costs. And this is simply not true. And um, now I will like present you a simple model that maybe helps you to um, yeah, get a rough estimation of, of how much um, you can actually solve depending on how your build process looks like or your, de your development process. So this is a pretty simple model of a, of a development process and um, again, uh, different companies handle that in, in different ways. Um, let's say this is one sprint, you do development, and after this is done, you have some testing phase. Testing can mean I, we have customers where the developers do the testing, and we have customers where like, product management is usually driving testing efforts, and then we have customers who have own Q&A teams, right? And depending on that, you can get an understanding how much, how much effort you spend there, and then of course you have always the rollout phase, which um, also can be quite annoying if it's not um, automated. You have to generate screenshots in different languages. You have to uh, publish it to either the app stores or your internal EDM network infrastructure and roll it out. So, and what you can see already, the only part from that process you really save time or could save time is the development phase because you need to do the rest anyway. Now the question is how much time from my experience in our projects, we can save. And I would say, if I have to give a rough number, it's about 25%. So it's far uh, away from 50%. Why is that? When we develop a cross-platform app, our developers basically have, um, they have an, an, an iPhone and an Android device all the time attached to their computers and uh, each um, commit they do, or before they do each commit, they really run the application, even the smallest feature, on all devices, right? So um, you don't save any time there. There are so many pitfalls, issues that, that come up in those integration layers that you cannot build it on one platform and um, try to ship it. So before each merge, each development step, they will run it on both platforms. Um, in addition to that, as I said, even simpler features like uh, notifications or um, how do you enable GPS? How do you configure certain uh, permissions? Or how do you handle in-app purchases? These are all things you need to do twice, no matter what framework you use on top. And this is also something that um, yeah, will reduce the time. Um, you might end up with something like 35% if you have a very simple application, or if you have a more complex application, it can down to 10%. But like as a rule of thumb, that is what I 
can come up with. Now, going back to the overall process, let's assume um, we have like 70% of the resources are really spent on development, and then we have a testing process which needs 25% um, of the resources, and we spend 5% of the time on rollout. You can see that these um, savings are actually narrowed down to even 70.5%. Uh, Again, please don't take this number and also an absolute number. Just have a look at your processes, how you spend time, how your team is set up, um, how big your testing team is, and, and based on that, I think um, you can get a rough number and then make an um, yeah, economic decision if, in the end, the framework makes sense or not. Um, then, we also heard that before, in the talk before, um, economics is also a question of risk, and the biggest risk, of course, is the vendor login. So once you decided to build your app with a, a framework technology, um, with a, a cross-platform technology, um, you're having a quite hard time to switch back from that. I know there are coming up approaches where you have like hybrid, also with React Native hybrid approaches, you have part is native, part is React, uh, part is React Native. Um, but in general, if your vendor decides he doesn't want to continue um, the, the framework anymore and there's no community driving it, um, you basically are back to square one. You have to like rebuild the app from scratch. And of course, this is a risk. I think I've seen startup companies taking that risk fairly easy. But um, in like the decision processes, again, of larger enterprise organization, this can be um, also a killer for the, for the whole cross-platform project, right? So I've seen people that say, no, this is too risky. We really move back to, to, to native. Um, at the same time, um, there's something about switching costs. So I, I heard people say, hey, we have these two native apps, and um, we don't want to really maintain both at the same time anymore. Um, can you guys help us to switch to a cross-platform framework? And then, um, yeah, when you, when you get into talks, usually those projects die because there's really no business case for that. Um, you only if you like want to have really large iterations on the product, if you do a lot of new features, improvements, or large refactorings, then this could be an option. But uh, if you have a relatively stable product, I really haven't seen an, econ an, an economic use case yet for switching that over to a, to a native um, or to a cross-platform frameworks. But there are more upsides, and um, this is especially true, the first one, so that you don't have to hire um, people for two different platforms um, because if you look at smaller projects, right? for example, if you have a project that one full-time um, developer can easily build, um, it's usually easier to have, um, in, in my personal experience, to have like one developer on that in term, in, instead of having two developers on that because, of course, then you have to onboard meet and organize two developers instead of one. So in small projects, I think this can, this can uh, get you, get you an, an upside. Um, then, and of course, this can also be discussed um, uh, later in terms of how realistic is it to reuse some of the code you do for your um, uh, cross-platform apps in uh, web applications later and the other way around. Um, I think there are some pretty interesting developments going on. Um, I never have seen that in the enterprise context that, um, that have been used in production before, um, but maybe in the future this is a pretty interesting um, process. Um, at the same time, when your organization requires you to do um, code certification processes, so basically before you're allowed to ship a release, they have a lot of tools and analyze of, of the, the code to make sure um, they comply with security guidelines, internal guidelines, and again, open source guidelines, then um, you can also streamline this process because you only have one code base and one technology you need to, you need to review, um, which can give you, give you some advantage here. To summarize this, um, so I think cross-platform frameworks in the enterprise uh, context allow you really to build great applications with a single technology, um, and you can save up to maybe about 20% of the costs if all the things I mentioned before are met. So that means you need to ensure your organization has the right culture um, in order to adapt these new technologies, and you have to, uh, the, the organization has to be able to recruit this, um, suitable people in time. Um, I would always look from a product perspective at things and say, only do it if a product um, really has very little platform-specific code. 
And finally, um, if you want to get a very detailed picture of how your profits and saving looks like, really take a deep analysis of your existing processes, um, a full-fledged review of your requirements you're looking at, and um, then you get a pretty good understanding um, of what the budget looks like. Yeah, and that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I would be interesting to hear your feedback or your experiences now. Thank you, Jan.